Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be talking with you today about Sarah Childress Polk, the wife of our 11th president, James Knox Polk. Sarah was born in, on September 4th, 1803, just a few miles out of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, to Joel and Elizabeth Childress. Her parents were part of the North Carolina natives who were going to move out west to Tennessee. They were very close friends with Andrew and Rachel Jackson. And as a matter of fact, Sarah grew up referring to them as Uncle Andrew and Aunt Rachel. The family was very wealthy. I believe tobacco was their primary source of wealth. Their, the daughters were Susan and Sarah, and they were well-educated both at home and in private academies. So she was very polished, very well-educated. She was eventually sent uh, to a school, the Moravian Female Academy in Salem, North Carolina. She had spent time in academies in Murfreesboro and in Nashville. So she was well-traveled, well-educated, well-rounded. Both girls were, and they were taught to use their minds. And I think that's very important to understanding Mrs. Polk. Sarah had dark hair and very dark eyes and a deep olive complexion, sort of not what you was a typical look for someone considered beautiful in this day, but she was. And if you look at some of the portraits of her, you can see how lovely she was. We don't know much about the courtship between Sarah and James. But uh, just uh, let me tell you this, James Knox Polk was a protege of Andrew Jackson, sort of cut in the political mold of Jackson. I don't know that their personalities were at all alike, but Polk had some of the same political views and issues uh, as did his mentor, Jackson. So I'll just tell you this very quickly. In the election of 1844, it's between James K. Polk and Henry Clay. So here you have um, that old Jackson versus the Whig dispute. Here it goes again, and Polk is the winner. So uh, just to tell you, give you that is sort of what's what's going to propel him into the White House. But let me give you this little bit of information I think is interesting. When Andrew Jackson was advising. Uh, James about how to proceed with his political career. He told him, he said, you know, you need a good wife. You need to have a good wife. And uh, Mr. Polk said, well, do you have anyone in mind? And of course, Andrew did. He said, the one who will never give you trouble, her wealth, family, and education, her health and appearance are all superior. You know her well. And James said, do you mean Sarah Childress? and I shall go at once and ask her. So he's not gonna dilly-dally around. They had uh, been acquaintances and getting the stamp of approval and the suggestion from his mentor, that was all he needed. And, from, and, the, and they will get married in 1824, and we believe that they had a very successful marriage, and they were rarely apart, enjoyed being together, and sadly, they never had any children. And I think that, um, gosh, how do I want to say that without getting too far ahead of myself? I think that the absence of children made her husband's career and welfare her constant, her consistent, primary concern. So I want to give her some credit there. Um, you'll understand why I say that in a, in a few moments. Again, they were married on January 1st, 1824, in her family's home, which was very typical of the day. He was 28, she was 20, and they seem to have a lot to talk about. They seem to be very close, again, from secondary sources that I have seen. However, running a household in the mold of Martha or Abigail or even Dolly, running a household in that sense was not her specialty. And she wasn't particularly adept at it, keeping house. Now, when you and I think of keeping house, we think of vacuuming and dusting and what are we going to fix for supper? But here it involved a lot more, especially if you were a person of some means. 
and if you had servants, if you had responsibilities to them or uh, things that came out of the household that were part of a business. So you, it was much more than just figuring out uh, which kind of, of uh, laundry detergent to use. So, and that just wasn't how she was brought up. And in some ways, I think that's very interesting is I don't want to use the word modern, but she was she was brought up in a different mold, uh, not brought up necessarily with these arts. And um, I think that's kind of interesting. In your textbook, uh, there is an interesting quote. Apparently someone in the election of 1844 had allowed us how they were going to support uh, Henry Clay because, quote, his wife, mean, uh, meaning Clay's, his wife made good butter and knew how to look after a house. Sarah said, if I get to the White House, I will neither keep house nor make butter. And to me, that is uh, quite an interesting frankness about where her interests really were. Now, I have sent you a clip of Mrs. Clinton um, that I hope you've watched. I hope you can watch it. It's on um, YouTube. If for some reason it doesn't work, please let me know. But I remember hearing this quote when she said, you know, she's not going to stand by her man like um, the old Tammy Wynette song, and she's not going to be home baking cookies. And even as late as the 1990s, Hillary was disparaged by some elements of American culture for that, and I didn't particularly care for it either. So I don't want you to compare in your mind these two women because they're very different. However, I would argue that probably Mrs. Polk's um, absence of being a typical female managing the household, you know, I'm not like that, I'm not going to make butter, there were probably those who felt about her the way some of us have felt about Mrs. Clinton for the things that she said. So it's very interesting. And, and I do want you to know that uh, the more liberal side of history has embraced Mrs. Polk because of this comment and because she was educated and because she participated in her husband's decision making. And it goes on and on. They've held her up again an almost a pseudo iconic you know view like they do Eleanor and Abigail so I think in a way Mrs. Polk might be sort of shown a little disservice in that um, she's simply saying those aren't the things I do and I'm not going to pretend that I do them and I don't look at her as being as, as disavowing her womanhood or you know trying to start a revolution in, in the social order but that's, that's something that you can think about. When I was reading about Mrs. Polk, when I first put this class together years ago, I thought that she might be like Abigail, but I, I was hoping um, she would have a little more acceptance since we moved down the timeline. Um, but uh, actually, she will receive some of the same bad press. She had grown up, Sarah had grown up, like Abigail, in a home where education was valued. She had grown up in a home where her opinion was valued. And she will, as First Lady, continue to um, talk about her views of what's going on in politics. She'd grown up in a political home again, uh, educated political home. She'd grown up around Uncle Andrew and Aunt Rachel she she had uh, had a bird's eye view of a lot of these discussions and so when her husband is president she's quite articulate i don't think she's out you know doing any protesting or, or making a spectacle of herself but just the very fact that um, she would she knew things and could discuss them in front of others in, in a, any kind of social meeting probably set her apart and didn't give her some bad press. She served as her husband's secretary and his research assistant. Well, I think that's marvelous. I think that's marvelous. And I could probably make a good case to you that so did Martha Washington and so did Abigail. But part of the game is to make sure that nobody knows that. 
So uh, I don't look at her as necessarily a feminist in the way the way we see feminism. I don't look at that at all. I look at her as trying to help her husband in the ways that she knew how. And that comes from a woman who is married to a historian and we do things together and we've helped each other on research projects and things. We have a wonderful thing in common like that. And that's how I see I see um, Mrs. Polk is that she used the, the training that she had, the experiences that she had to help her husband not usurp his role, not grab the spotlight, not embarrass him, but to help him with her ability to do so. So I, um, and you can look into her life, read what uh, uh, Mrs. Crowley says in the text, and look into, there's some other things out there on the internet. You can look in the First Lady site, but don't dismiss her uh, at this point as someone who was simply trying to be Mrs. President. That's not it at all. I don't, I don't see that at all. She would always defer to her husband. And that's a key difference that I see between her and Eleanor is the deference. She would often say, well, my husband believes. My husband believes. If I ask a question, my husband believes. And I, I think that's lovely. Um, that's not being a doormat. That's being a good, that's being a good uh, representative of your family. Now, she wanted to bring a little more dignity to the White House. She felt uh, that Julia's dances and some of the social gatherings there were a little beyond the dignity of the office. And and to be honest with you, if you read anything about James Polk, he was kind of serious and taciturn and uh, not the life of the party. So, of course, we can say the same thing for Madison and some of the others, but she, she wanted to play on that dignity and make the White House a place of a place of formality and that I love that I love that and and that's the beauty of the White House is it can to a certain degree conform to the unique personalities of those very unique occupants so but she bans dancing and you go oh Miss Justice oh no she did uh, she was very strong in her faith I'm pretty sure she was a Presbyterian but please let me double check that I should know I apologize for that she, was, she had very strong conservative leanings in deportment and uh, behavior, and she banned dancing. Uh, she banned alcohol. All hard liquor was banned completely. Some wine was allowed on special occasions, and uh, I rather like that as well. She would not conduct business on Sundays, and there was not, Sundays were not a day for social calls. And again, I, I love that. I have written on my notes that there were two great forces in Sarah's life, religion and her husband. And to be honest with you, I can't, I can't imagine a better way to live. Um, I wish we could have put a number three uh, children there uh, for her, but they sadly were not ever able to have any. And I believe, I want to say this uh, kind of as we, we get ready to close, uh, Sarah and, and James having no children, I think, shaped their relationship more than any other factor. Her primary career became his career, looking after him, taking care of him in his political endeavors. And uh, I, I, I think your text will support that, that view. Uh, like Abigail Adams, she wanted to support her husband uh, as much as she could, but the Times didn't quite always understand the unique gifts that she had to bring to help him. Um, after the election of 1848, sadly, uh, he, President Polk will die just a few months after the election, uh, I think in 1849. She will live on until 1891. And they lived, she lived in their home called Polk Place in Nashville. Uh, so, and I don't believe that it exists anymore. Daughter Justice is the expert on all these great historic sites. But I don't believe that it exists anymore. But uh, their, their home was their, was their love. And uh, she had uh, adopted, well, she was a niece that she 
took on as her ward and loved as a daughter that sort of looked after her Sally for a while. But uh, there's so much more to say about Sarah, and I hope that you will get a chance to look into her life. I believe I will say this. Um, I love things like this, and I try not to get too bogged down, but she loved dressing well, and um, she ha she loved beautiful, modest clothing, and there. In, that's why I sent you that clip. I hope you enjoy it uh, about you know some of her gowns and things. And she was lovely, and but I think she she brought a great deal of elegance and poise to the White House, and as you know. Um, I, I run as far from feminism as I possibly can, but I do like the idea that God gives us minds and gives us intellects and that we can use them to help our husbands as much as we might be able to use some of the other more feminine arts, um, cooking and keeping house and raising children. But I, I see this as a wonderful gift that he had given her uh, and the training that her family standing had been able to afford, I think that she put these to great use. So I encourage you to look a little more at, at our Sarah if you can. Let me tell you a little bit about what I plan to do. I'm going to have to be out of town for a couple of days and I'm sorry about that. I'm going to uh, see my brother. I've not seen in a long time. And I'm going to send you next, I don't know when I will get it done, but I'm going to send you next some written information about uh, Mrs. Zachary Taylor and Mrs. Millard Fillmore. They're both very interesting ladies. Zachary Taylor, who is Knox's successor, will die very quickly in office and be succeeded by Millard Fillmore, probably the most anonymous of all of American presidents. But his wife, Abigail, is a gem. She is a, another of our hidden treasures. And I will try to write up some interesting things, hopefully, for you for your notebook. For you to include in there just like if we were taking notes in class then i will do a lecture when i return i will do a lecture on jane pierce and jane pierce oh my goodness i is she had such a difficult experience coming to the white house and uh, again a woman of great and tremendous christian faith who was misunderstood and we'll talk about her then we'll talk about james buchanan's niece Harriet Lane, and then we move to Mary. And from Mary, we'll talk about, after we get through with Mary Lincoln, we'll move into Julia Dent Grant, and then Lucy Rutherford Hayes. And uh, I may then jump to um, uh, Mrs. McKinley, Ida McKinley, and then uh, Teddy Roosevelt's wives. He had two wives. Uh, the first died quite young into their marriage and he, he will remarry, then we'll try to move forward as quickly as we can. I'm enjoying this tremendously. I'm very grateful that you've allowed me to communicate with you in this way. And when I get back, if you would like to have, um, Carrington, if you would like to have a Zoom meeting or talk on FaceTime or something like that, um, I would be so glad to do that with you. So you let me know what you think and uh, we'll get together soon and I will be um, accessible through if you need to email me or text me while I'm gone, let me know. I'll be leaving tomorrow morning, which is Thursday, and then I'll be back late Saturday night. But certainly feel free to send me any questions if you have anything. And I hope, like me, that you have just fallen in love with this couple and with this story. And I do encourage you um, at any time to, to just Google the gowns. Uh, if there's a first lady that 